name is Barbara Goodman, and I'm representing Cures Within Reach. We're a US-based uh, not-for-profit. Um, I want to thank the Find a Cure team. I want to thank Rick for having us here. We're thrilled to be here. Um, and I'm thrilled to see a room full of people talking about drug repurposing, um, because we've been focused on all repurposing for over a decade now, and it's truly exciting to have repurposing part of the conversation um, not only with rare diseases, but with a lot of different organizations, we're really seeing um, an increase in the dialogue about the opportunities that repurposing can bring to all patients. So we're thrilled. Um, we're thrilled with this this uh, turnout, and we're thrilled to be here. I'm going to spend um, the next uh, small amount of time talking a little bit about our organization, what we do, how we do it, the impact we're making, and then I'm specifically going to spend some time talking about how organizations, companies, can create value in their repurposing ideas, how institutions, universities, and academicians can think about creating commercial value, and um, other types of related opportunities in, in truly in making an impact to patients. So a little bit about our organization. I already said we've been around focused solely on repurposing since 2008. Um, in that time, um, we have funded um, over 85 different projects in repurposing, mostly in clinical trials, a little bit of preclinical. Um, but the most important thing about this slide is that we're disease agnostic. So we don't just focus on rare diseases. We do a lot in rare diseases. We focus on any disease area that can be impacted by repurposing. And we focus on any geographic area as well. We funded over 50 different institutions with those 85 projects. Today we have projects in the United States, Canada, in Europe, and our first in Australia just um, a couple months ago as well. Um, we have invested, and our ideal time period is investing in the project just when it has um, enough idea, it's hypothesis driven, it's investigator initiated, but the opportunity is we put in a little bit of money and it catalyzes, once that result occurs, others interested in those projects. So in the United States, it might be the NIH, it could be private foundation money, it could be Horizon 2020 here in Europe, um, but we love to catalyze that project. We call it the comeback when time. So as researchers in the room, you may know you have an idea and you go talk to an agency and they say, really interesting, come back when you know it works in five patients, come back when you have the dosing figured out. That's exactly when we like to fund because it catalyzes follow-on funding, it catalyzes publications, it catalyzes all the trickle down from there. So a little bit about definitions. You've heard, um, actually, in, in this co conversation today, you haven't heard much um, opposing views, but I'm going to clarify exactly what we mean when we talk about repurposing. For Cures Within Reach, um, we focus on repurposing when there already has been regulatory agency approval. It doesn't need to solely be the FDA. It could absolutely be the EMA. It could be another agency. It could be Japan. It could be Australia. Um, but there has been regulatory approval, which is slightly different than what we call repositioning or rescue when it might have gotten to phase two or phase three, but it didn't go all the way to a regulatory agency approval, not necessarily because of a bad result. Things get shelved. Strategics decide to make a, a different move, so it doesn't necessarily mean it didn't work. It just didn't move forward to, to approval, and that's what we call reposition and rescue, an excellent way to look at um, repurposing broadly, but not how we define repurposing. We also focus on both the commercial and the philanthropic opportunities. Um, well, today I'm going to be spending most of my time on the commercial side because I've been asked to focus on that. We love the philanthropic side because any patient knows and any caregiver knows and all the patients and patient groups out here know, they don't care how the treatment gets to the patient, whether there's commercial value or not. And so we focus on patient impact and unmet medical need when there's both commercial or philanthropic opportunity. Um, a little bit about a, a great example of a success story that we have. Um, we funded this, as you can see, quite a long time ago is when we started it. 
with some late stage animal and then uh, a phase one. We put in $78,000 a long, long time ago. This is an, a very rare disease. Um, this was done um, out of Children's Hospital in Philadelphia in a disease called ALPS. Um, these patients were in and out of the ICU, the hospital, and they often didn't live um, to see adulthood. They, they died young, unfortunately. Um, this is what I refer to now as this magic sirolimus drug, because everyone's repurposing sirolimus. Um, but this, um, these patients um, took two pills a day, and suddenly they're not healthy again. This is not a cure, but they're able to live generally uh, normal lives. So we funded a little bit of money. This was a great example of an off-label use in the United States. You can do this off-label. Um, patients started um, receiving this treatment because of a really strong publication in this case. He then got um, $1.2 million from the NIH, exactly the type of project we love to see. And um, not only did it work in Alps, but once it worked in one autoimmune disease, he tested it in four others, uh, five others, and it worked in four of the five, and those patients are, um, are now seeing treatment as well. It's a great example for us of uh, impacting patients broadly and how we define success. So we have three different types of funding at Cures Within Reach. Um, the first is the mainstay of our organization, research grants. These are non-dilutive grants to research institutions, investigator-initiated ideas between fifty dollars and $250,000 uh, U.S., and um, we fund the academic institutions. About a year ago, we started doing what we call uh, con conditional payback grants. So this is when um, a number of other not-for-profits and disease groups are doing this. But this is when we might give $100,000 to a researcher if and only if the university outlicenses it, sells the asset, creates a spin-out, creates a, a funding in to the university, we will get paid back a fixed and um, tied amount. So um, if we do $100,000, we might get $200,000 or $300,000, but it's not tied to royalties. It's not tied to intellectual property. It's a conditional payback that allows us as a not-for-profit to start building some self-sustainability. Again, we're not the first ones. We're a fast follower. There are a number of other organizations that are doing this kind of funding um, for their projects at institutions. The other thing we started um, about not quite two years ago is called our Impact Awards. So this is when we invest in a project. It's that same comeback when time. We invest in a project that is connected to equity when there is commercial value, but they're needing to get that proof of concept, proof of principle, so they can go raise a Series B like Helix did, so they can go raise corporate venture funds and other funding. So that's um, also another um, a way that we do funding. Again, building a portfolio, it's still repurposing. We don't yet know it's gonna work. And the goal is to create a portfolio of self-sustainability for our organization. Um, in terms of when we fund, as you can imagine, we love to fund the proof of concept phase one. We know it's safe, we know it's effective, but they, the researcher just needs that initial um, human data or that first step could be a pilot trial, it could be five to 10 patients. We often fund five to 10 patients, just enough to get started. Um, what's interesting though is how we delineate when there's no commercial value, the philanthropic side, versus likely or known commercial value. Um, this up here is going to be off-label use. We support clinicians making their own decisions with uh, published and validated studies. Um, when there's commercial value, we actually don't use the word repurposing because investors don't like the word repurposing. Uh, PE group, private equity, corporate venture, often pharma, don't like the word repurposing. It's seen as non-innovative. We in this room might think differently. Um, often we do, um, but we follow, um, we follow um, what um, is used anecdotally. And so we just stopped using the word repurposing. What we instead say is proven therapies that enhance the therapeutic benefit. It's the same, the same thing. But investors don't like the word repurposing, so we stopped using it. 
And this is really truly where our focus is, is getting patient access to the treatments that they need. As I said earlier, we are not focused in rare diseases, and we're not even focused solely on drugs. We do drugs, devices, diagnostics. As you can imagine, 50% of our projects are in rare diseases because it naturally fits repurposing. Um, and about 75% of our projects are in the pharmaceutical space, but we do uh, fund devices, diagnostics, and, and others as well. Um, I do want to make a quick shout out since we're in the rare disease space. We have an open call for proposals in rare blood cancer and a rare site impairment disease. The proposals are due March 6th. It's the proposal stage, not a full grant that you'd need to submit. If any of you know researchers with ideas, we are looking for funding for a clinical project, proof of, proof of trial, uh, proof of um, uh, proof of concept human uh, small pilot data in any rare blood cancer and in any, uh, specifically in the retinitis pigmentosa disease space. Um, the others on here, you can see we do have a wide variety of projects. And just um, one fascinating thing, for those of you who were here this morning and you talked about um, Dr. Strupp, who was this amazing uh, German uh, physician who's got this vertigo drug and he helped to create intrabio. We actually funded him in repurposing for Meniere's disease, which is an inner ear disorder that vertigo is one of the, um, one of the uh, symptoms of. Um, we funded him from our RFP last year. So he's a great um, person. We know him and, and we're funding him in a totally different space than the intra, intra bio um, project that they're doing. But if you know anyone who's got um, ideas for any of these, please do reach out and, and go to our website for more information. Our rare disease community, as you've heard um, from a number of other speakers today, it truly takes a village. And we've built a rare disease community to get all of the conversations at the same table, including government, whether it's the FDA, whether it's NICE, um, whether it's any, the, the NCATs in the United States. Philanthropy needs to be involved as well. There's a number of not-for-profits here in the room today. Industry, whether it's a small biotech startup or a very, very large uh, corporation, pharma player, they all have to be at the table. And obviously the patient groups, the disease groups, and then universities are all part of the conversation. How we do this is through a donor advised impact philanthropy model. I'm not going to go through this slide, except we go where our funders want us to go. So if there's a focus in rare blood cancers, we have an RFP in blood cancers. We have a donor today who's interested in making an impact in um, Meniere's disease. That's why we have um, Meniere's disease calls for proposal. Um, so specifically talking about building value, um, I'm going to spend most of my time on um, commercial value, where the money is and where the products are. But I do want to just give a couple uh, minutes to the philanthropic value, because I don't want to overlook off-label use or generics making an impact in, in generics. So I mentioned earlier this, um, this magic sirolimus drug that is just amazing because um, for those of you who don't know, Castleman's disease is a rare um, disease. And there's a researcher out of UPenn, um, University of Pennsylvania, David Fagenbaum. He actually has um, made um, pr uh, more news than normal because he uh, published a book about six months ago called Chasing My Cure. He was a medical student when he had this disease, and he literally found his own cure for sirolimus. It's a, uh, using sirolimus. It's a fascinating story. He started a patient disease um, network and um, is really making an impact in that. And there's, it's a generic. There's no commercial value in that example. Um, the other example here is in glioblastoma. We uh, funded MassGen Harvard, who's doing some work um, on a, a generic. Um, in this case, they're doing um, oh, two different chemo drugs, um, hydroxyurea and another ge um, generic drug, and they're combining it. Um, the actual clinical trial itself, the patients are in Amsterdam, and we funded the piece of the project that's going on in MassGen. Um, there's also a lot of um, projects in neglected diseases. DNDI is based in, um, in uh, Switzerland, and they're doing amazing, amazing work making an impact in patients in a number of different diseases. 
And then at the University of Toronto, we funded a project using Nabilone. Um, talk about patient impact, but there's also caregiver impact. This is game changing for Alzheimer's uh, caregivers using a generic. Um, in terms of the commercial value, I'm only going to highlight some very high level examples of how you can create value in, um, in repurposing drugs specifically. Out of the University of Cancer, Kansas Cancer Center, they created a Cyclopyrox, which is a bladder cancer drug. In this case, it was actually a topical antifungal had absolutely nothing to do with cancer. Um, they changed, not only um, did they change the method of use using, um, it's now an IV or a subcutaneous, but it's in a, a completely different um, opportunity. That's in phase one. They spun it out into a startup called Cyclomed coming out of, of um, Kansas. Another great example is coming out of Georgetown University. This is an, um, using nilotinib, which is Novartis's drug that um, at the time still had patent life. Um, there was a Parkinson's that's gone through phase one and phase two, and Novartis actually funded, um, donated some of the drug for that. We funded the follow-on to the repurposing opportunity. So it was working in Parkinson's. Georgetown wanted to test it in Huntington's, which is the piece that we uh, funded, and they're actually doing other neurodegenerative diseases as well. Another great example is um, Ruxolitinib, who is, um, it's known as Jackify on the market. It's a branded product, and that's being used at St. Jude's. They've created a little bit of intellectual property for a very ultra rare PEDS immune disorder. You can also do this by uh, dosing and formulation changes. Viagra is the well-known example of that. But a lot of people don't realize that at Horizon, which is a pharmaceutical um, therapeutic biotech company based in Chicago, where I am based, they IPO'd, they went public off of Duexis, um, which is not only an example of a, a dosing and formulation change, but it's also an example about a combination drug. So they took, um, the ingredient in Pepsid, which was um, then reused and repurposed into rheumatoid arthritis, and they combined it with another, um, another drug as well. And then there's a, a way to do it via delivery mechanism. So similar to the Cyclomed example in the first one where you're, they changed it from a topical to an IV, uh, Surratt Therapeutics is a Chicago-based spin-out that's taking IGF-1 and um, they're changing it into a nasal um, to treat migraines. Um, and that's um, in um, early stages as well. And then there is the opportunity to do this through combining approved therapies. So Duexis from Horizon is already one example. Another example is in, um, is in AML, uh, very specific pieces of AML, where Jazz uh, took two approved drugs, both used in cancer, um, and combined it into a very specific um, treatment that went, um, they got FDA approval several years ago as well. And I already mentioned um, Duexis. And um, the last area is in regulatory exclusivity. So this is a little bit different in the United States versus in Europe, but there is a great example, and many, many, many pharma companies go after a pediatric use. Novartis did this with nilotinib. Another great example is um, for Cushing syndrome in the rare disease space. Um, Mefepristone is, um, is known as, uh, it's a miscarriage drug. It was on the market and approved um, specifically to end pregnancy. Corsep Therapeutics realized it actually can be used for Cushing syndrome. And so that is now, they changed the dosing from 200 to 300 meg milligrams, and it's now got orphan de designation to treat uh, Cushing syndrome, interestingly enough. Um, one other example I wanted to tell you about and um, that is right here local in London is um, a great medical device example. So we had a speaker from St. George Hospital. So just um, last month, there's a doctor, um, Mark Gallagher, out of St. George's in London, who published and presented his um, study about a, a patient temperature management product that's approved in Europe, it's approved in Canada, it's approved in the United States for patient warming and cooling. And he realized that it could solve a thermal injury problem during ablation for cardiac um, ablation during um, AFib procedures. So he published 
um, this study um, and presented, and he is now, the company is now going after that new indication based on uh, peer-reviewed study. So this does not need to be just drugs. It does not need to be um, just rare diseases, but hopefully this gives you, all of you, some thoughts on how to think about the ways to create commercial value or create uh, philanthropic value when there's no way around that. So questions? <laughs>